Hey guys, uh, my name is Yubin Raut. I'm a third year, wait, no, uh, fourth year PhD student <laughs> at uh, University of Southern California. I work in Doug Capone's lab. And most of what we do is we focus on the nitrogen cycle. So that's what I'm going to speak to you guys about alongside uh, a little bit about my project here uh, this summer and also the past few summers. But before I get into that, I just wanted to give a little background about who I am, where I'm from, and why I'm standing before you here today. So I was originally born and raised in Nepal, which is ironically a landlocked country. So for the first eight, nine years of my life, I didn't have any contact with the ocean. Didn't really even think about the fact that it existed. <coughs> encompasses like 70% of the planet's surface. But as you can see, it's a very geographically beautiful country. We're locked in, there's lots of mountain ranges. So I grew up always being outdoors, hiking, exploring. So I was always fascinated by how the world around us works. Uh, and about at about the age of eight, I moved to the US, uh, kind of a switch up there because I moved to North Texas, lived in a suburb, grew up there outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, and it took a little while, but I assimilated into what would be U.S. culture and whatnot. I grew up uh, playing lots of sports, also spending a lot of time outside, going to school. And then in high school is where I kind of developed my interest in natural sciences. Did lots of things like joining environmental club and exploring as uh, limited geographical terrains of Texas has to provide. Um, and because we're living up in Dallas, which is still about seven, seven hours driving distance away from the nearest coastline at the Gulf of Mexico, I still didn't have much influence by the ocean quite yet. Uh, eventually, I ended up going to Texas A&M University in 2011, where I started off uh, doing a bachelor's in biology with the intent to go into the medical field initially. But then as I was doing it, I realized I was really captivated by the world around us, and I wanted to do more research-oriented things. And I also really wanted to travel, so I picked up a second major doing geology only realizing that they do a lot of traveling around North America, going on these field, camp, field camps all over the place. And through that, I was able to travel up to a lot of really cool places where we do uh, extensive backpacking and field camps in like Utah, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and whatnot. And then um, throughout that, it was like a three and a half year stint, still no contact or influence by the ocean or the marine realm whatsoever. And my last semester, just kind of off of a whim, I decided I wanted to take a minor in oceanography. So I stacked it up with all uh, marine-related courses, and I realized just within a week or two, I was really captivated by what, what I was learning, and I really wanted to pursue that further on. And that's kind of about the time I decided I wanted to pursue a PhD in oceanography. And that's when the process of applying for schools along the West Coast, East Coast kind of started, and somewhat brought me over to USC. So maybe asking why USC as opposed to other schools that exist along California, Oregon, Washington, and places down the East Coast is uh, primarily I, I really thought I would enjoy the area of research that our lab focuses on, but obviously coming in fresh, I didn't really know what all that entailed. It was, to be honest, it was Wrigley that kind of won me over because during our interviews when they flew us out here, um, we spoke with professors in the department and everything. And one primary thought I had was like, well, you know, PhD is a long-term commitment five-year program usually ends up taking longer than five years anyway because things don't always go right. Um, so I thought, oh, what, what better place than California? Um, and then they brought us out here during the interviews and gave us a tour of the island and the marine facility, kind of like what you guys will go through a little bit today. And I fell in love and I kept imagining spending summers out here doing research and I thought, wow, that would be a dream come true. So it's kind of surreal standing before you now. This is like my third summer in a row. I believe, yeah, third summer in a row spending almost the whole summer out here. And I'm looking forward to another great summer. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, but now I want to kind of move forward to explain kind of what our lab focuses on, which is like I was explaining the nitrogen cycle, which is depicted on the left here. This figure is not here to overwhelm you, maybe a little bit, just to kind of show you how complicated the cycle itself is. I'm mainly going to talk very briefly about this first arrow process right here, nitrogen fixation. But as you can see, there's a lot of intermediate pathways involving a lot of different organisms, ranging from microbes all the way up higher in the food chain. And a lot of times what we learn about is the nitrogen cycle on terrestrial ecosystems, but obviously our lab focuses on it in the marine realm. Um, so as important as it is, I kind of want to highlight why we should even care about nitrogen as an element. It's First and foremost, it's a very key macronutrient that all living organisms need, going from the smallest microbes to the largest organisms like blue whales and whatnot. It's an essential uh, 
component of biomolecules that every living organism has, like DNA, RNA, proteins, amino acids, all that kind of stuff. So as important as it is, it's kind of funny that most of us can't access the largest reservoir of uh, nitrogen that exists in our planet, which is in the atmosphere. Uh, as you guys may know, most of the atmosphere, about 78%, is dinitrogen gas. And unfortunately, we're not equipped to utilize this large reservoir of nitrogen that is available to us. However, there are these really specialized suite of microbes, uh, mostly bacteria and archaea, that have the enzyme to catalyze this conversion of dinitrogen gas into a bioavailable form, which is how it enters the base of the food web, whether it be marine or terrestrial, and then how human beings normally get their nitrogen requirements we eat something else that already has the amino acids and proteins that we need. Uh, but in the marine realm, I'm going to talk more about the microbes that are involved in this process. Um, and so just to give you guys a few examples of what kind of organism I'm talking about, they usually exist in three different forms. On the top left is the most classical forms, is kind of how they're discovered as well in soil terrestrial systems. These are images of root nodules of legumes and all the little uh, cylindrical rod shaped bacteria you see there are nitrogen fixing associates with the root nodule so they provide fixed nitrogen for the plant as it grows. Um, and then back in the day, this is why they would do crop rotation with legume plants. Normally when you're doing agricultural practices, when you grow, let's say corn or whatever, it's gonna take up all the nitrogen in that immediate area uh, in the field. So when next season comes around, the soil is depleted in nitrogen, right? So either you're gonna have to add in fertilizer like manure or leaf uh, uh, detritus, or you can plant a crop rotation with legumes where you, they don't need the nitrogen from the soil itself because they harbor these bacteria that provide the fixed nitrogen for them. So that's one example. And I'm really interested in these associations because uh, kind of analogous to what's happening in terrestrial systems, we are looking primarily at associations with macroalgae, which are your aquatic plants, so to speak. And then on the right, you have another form of symbiosis. This one depicts a diatom, which is a marine organism, really small, but they actually harbor the nitrogen-fixing bacteria inside themselves. So they also receive nitrogen directly from the process that the bacteria itself carries out. But uh, don't get me wrong, they're not always in association with something else. You also have a lot of free-living uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the ocean. Uh, one really prime example would be this picture down here. All these filaments are uh, really famous, globally relevant bacteria known as trichodesmium. What they do is they form aggregates. So even though they're really microscopic, whenever they start forming aggregates, they can make little colonies like what you see here in either tufts, tufts, or puffs. And what's really cool is sometimes, even out in real big open ocean settings, they can form giant surface blooms. So as you can see here, it looks like somebody just kind of spread sawdust all over the surface of the ocean, but these are just blooms of trichodesmium. And at times, they can get so big that you can actually see it with satellite imagery that's uh, orbiting around the Earth. So from outer space, you can see these giant ma uh, macroscopic features of things that are actually microscopic, right? So they're influencing the ecosystem at a very grand level. Um, and with that, I want to highlight one more thing. I kept telling you guys it's only prokaryotic organisms, so bacteria and archaea that can fix nitrogen, but human beings kind of have figured out how to also harness the dinitrogen reservoir that we have in the atmosphere. And this is, I think, directly tied to a lot of the success and sustenance of this drastically growing human population. Since the 1950s, as you guys know, human populations have been on this exponential rise and Although we keep growing year after year, the planet itself is not getting bigger and neither is our reservoir of resources. Rather than expanding our reservoirs, we're actually diminishing them, right? So you might be thinking, well, how have we been able to support such high demands for food throughout all these years as we keep growing? And as we go along in the future, it's projected to be even more and more people on Earth. So how can we support such drastic increases in the human population? Well, actually what happened was Around the 1940s, post-World War II, these two scientists, Haber and Bosch, were able to utilize and invent this process that can take the dinitrogen gas that's in the atmosphere and industrially fix it into uh, bioavailable compounds of nitrogen, which we today normally know as fertilizers. And that's what's been able to really sustain human growth because our agricultural practices have been really, really good and our crop yields have been getting better and better. But obviously, that can only go to a certain point. 
So um, what's going to eventually limit our terrestrial practices is space availability. Like I was telling you, we're not really growing as a planet other than human population. And then, as you guys might be aware, especially on this island, we've been hit with it very recently, is these drastic droughts. So access to fresh water is also going to limit how well our agricultural practices are going to be in the future years. So with this kind of in mind, a lot of nations are starting to become really proactive and start trying to find solutions before, before this problem really hits us kind of out of nowhere, right? So what they're doing is they're starting to look to the ocean and aquaculture farms as a solution. Um, so with the ocean, as you can imagine, it covers most of the planet's surface, so we're not really limited by space, and it's mostly water, so we're not limited by water there either, but it's salt water, so we can't grow plants out there. But what we can do is try to harvest things that are native to the ocean, like macroalgae or different seafood sustenance. Um, and the, the key thing here with ocean farming systems that different nations start exploring how to uh, really get these things going is that they're always going to be limited by nutrients. And one of those key nutrients, again, it comes back to is nitrogen. So with that, I'll talk a little bit more about what we've been looking at with different macroalgal habitats that actually are all over the world, as you can imagine. Here we have a beautiful coastline with coves all around Catalina itself, but also the west and east coast of the U.S and other coastlines throughout the world. Macroalgae dominate these habitats, but it's not just limited to coastlines. You, whenever you go out to coral reefs, it, it can actually become a problem where you have phase shifts occurring from a coral-dominated reef to a macroalgal-dominated reef. And then, uh, just to show, highlight one more picture. Um, this, I know, may look like that trichodesmian bloom that I was showing earlier, but this is actually a macroalgal bloom that happens out in uh, open ocean settings, too. This is the species of sargassum that form little uh, clumps, and actually they're not so little because you can see they can be really, really large sometimes being... They're basically like floating islands, so to speak, right? So macroalgae are not just limited to coastal or coral reef systems or even the open ocean, but their productivity is almost always directly tied to their availability, to the availability of light and nutrients. And before we can figure out how to harvest them and use it for human uh, requirements like biofuels and food resources and whatnot, we need to kind of understand how they exist and how they're so productive in the natural system as it is. So that's kind of one of the goals that we've been looking at. And obviously our lab comes at it from the, that, the perspective of how do they get their nitrogen requirements. And these are really important ecosystems, as you guys know, if you've been snorkeling, you'll see them supporting a lot of micro and macro organisms. Um, and they're found, again, all over the world. So one thing that I would like to highlight is, again, human beings are constantly changing the, the world around us. So as much as nutrient dynamics do influence macroalgal productivity that naturally occurs, Whenever human beings have excess of nutrient loading, and since most of the human populations are really close to coastlines nowadays, what happens when you have eutrophication events? We put too much nutrients near our coast, right? And that can lead to things like this, where you have too big of a macroalgal bloom. So if you're a macroalgae, it's great because you get all the nutrients in the world and you get to grow and like you make these giant structures. But from an economic standpoint, this can be really taxing for uh, governments and countries to clean up. And this was actually a picture of a green tide. They're calling it a green tide because it's a green macroalgae that bloomed up in China when they were trying to host the Olympics. And they had to spend so much money trying to clean all this up so they could host all the marine sports for the Olympic at that time, right? So um, it can be kind of a problem as well. So I think I've already kind of stressed upon you guys how important nutrients are for macroalgae productivity. But not to take away from light, because light is also really important. These are all photosynthetic organisms. So what this means is they harness sunlight to drive the energy to <coughs> carbon fixation, and that's how they grow and accumulate biomass. But with regards to nutrients, obviously they're marine organisms, so they get it mostly from nutrients that accumulate in the water column. And then there's been a few studies that have actually shown that these nitrogen-fixing associates can also provide or supplement the nitrogen requirements for these macroalgae. So what we do and what I have been doing primarily for the past few years is whether it be along coastal sites, I haven't been at the coral reefs yet, but I did get to go out in the open ocean and we ran into a lot of these pelagic sargassum blooms. We collect macroalgae, uh, whether it be from free diving or hanging off the side of a boat like you see here. We bring it back into the lab and we put them into little vials and do incubations uh, at different time ranges. 
And during those incubations, we can indirectly assay for nitrogen fixation activity using a gas chromatogram. I'm not going to go too much into detail there, but I thought I'd just share a few of the results that have been compiled over the years, and then also kind of what we've been finding. Uh, so with a lot of different macroalgae species from that, that include brown macroalgae, green macroalgae, as well as red macroalgae, researchers since like the 60s and 70s have found nitrogen fixing associates to supply a lot of the nitrogen demand that these macroalgae have to grow on a day-to-day -day basis. Like for Podium, more commonly known as dead man's finger, Laurentia species, which is a red macroalgae. And what we did is when I first came into USC, it was right around the time where Sargassum orneri was has been an introduced species around Southern California coastal waters, but it's also been competing with the giant kelp forests around here. So one of the leading questions we had was, do they harbor more nitrogen fixers that could potentially supply them with extra nitrogen and give them an advantage? Is this why they're doing so well? So that was the, the leading question we had. So what I did for that first year in the summer was at different life cycle stages of sargassum ornari, we'd come out sample and uh, bring it back into the lab here and then assay for nitrogen fixation activity. The, the short answer is no. During most of its life cycle when it's living and healthy, we didn't have that high of rates. Basically nothing significant enough to provide it with enough nitrogen. But one thing that was really interesting was in the late summer when ambient nutrient concentrations in the water are at their lowest, not just around Catalina, but in the Southern California bite as a whole, we're finding like for about a two to three week sampling period, you have much higher increased activity of nitrogen fixation activity. And then just doing some rough back of the envelope calculations, we're able to see that roughly about 12% of the nitrogen demand for these juvenile sargassum uh, macroalgae during that two to three week period could be supplied by the nitrogen fixers associated with it. So that was really interesting. It turns out maybe for a short window in time when ambient nutrient concentrations can't supply nitrogen, the nitrogen fixers can play a role in supplementing nitrogen for their productivity. But one thing that kind of surprised us and fell out uh, unexpectedly was, although it's not a prominent process ongoing when it's living, at least for this one macroalgal species, what we did find was when it starts to senesce and die, which is right around this time in the summer, we're finding it to be a hot spot for nitrogen fixation. So it's almost like a reverse where the decomposing macroalgal systems are providing a niche for nitrogen fixers. And this is really important because what we mostly see are like living healthy uh, macroalgae when we go snorkeling and things like that. But up to like 90% of the macroalgal productivity that's around coastal habitats and also out in open oceans, they ultimately die and they sink out, right? So they, they eventually end up in the detrital food chain. And the fact that these nitrogen fixers are playing a role in that decomposition process is really interesting because uh, as opposed to other microbes that usually just strip that detritus of all the nutrients that's associated with it, what nitrogen fixers do is they actually deposit nitrogen upon that detritus, making it nutritionally richer. So the different suite of organisms that come after it or even uh, things like snails and urchins, they're gonna eat that detritus, get a new, more nutritionally packed meal, so to speak. And so with that in mind, we wanted to see if that's something happening just with sargassum ornari, or is it happening kind of ubiquitously with other macroalgae as well. So we've scaled the project up and we end up doing uh, field collections where we bring fresh macroalgae and we put them in little white mesh bags and allow them to degrade, so we're like forcing them to die, basically over a 20, 25 day period. And we subsample every few days and we try to figure out what the, the activity is and see if this is actually a process that's happening with lots of different macroalgae, and that's going to be the primary project I'll be working on this summer. So uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to some questions, but before that, obviously, none of this work would be possible without the funding uh, from Wrigley and the Vertex Fellowship, and then I really want to thank all, the whole staff at MSC and the crew of Ms. Christie who shuttle us back and forth from here to mainland, and then special thanks to Lauren and Kelly for all the help with lab accommodations, and then of course, I've had uh, a lot of great REUs in the past few summers that have helped me with these projects and all the members of my lab, as well as other fellows that come out with me to do these collections. So with that, I'll take any questions you guys may have. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be science related. <laughs> We're just processing all that. I know, it was like <laughs> information though. Yes, sir. I just had a quick question for you. Well, two questions. Uh, what's an REU? <laughs> <laughs>
an REU. It's actually a really cool program that the National Science Foundation sponsored. It's the research exchange for undergraduates. So undergraduates from different universities all over the US get to apply for this program. That, and basically, it's kind of a sweet deal. I kind of wish I had done it when I was an undergrad myself. But they allow for them to go to different marine labs or whatever field you're interested in and spend a summer out there doing research where your mentors are usually either graduate students or professors, and they take you on. They develop a project, and over a 10-week period, they carry out all the research, and then at the end, they do a presentation, and they get to spend time at cool places like out here at Wrigley or different marine stations around the U.S. So they're your interns or your assistants? Exactly. Your, your minions? Yeah, my, <laughs> my minions. <laughs> <laughs> and I did have one other question. I was yeah. just curious if you personally have read a book called The Alchemy of Air. The Alchemy of Air? I have not. If you have not, if, you, if in this field, you'll find it absolutely fascinating. It's the exhaustive history of the Haber-Bosch process and Fritz Haber's life story and exactly how he came to, you know, oh, wow. yeah, discover yeah. the catalyst and the whole thing and, and, and the interaction with, uh, you know, World War One and Two and the German The alchemy of air. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's That's a great record. Really interesting. And I, I read that book and it made me aware of the whole thing with the nitrogen cycle. Yeah. Uh, carbon, uh, you know, uh, excess carbon in the atmosphere is obviously the big thing in the zeitgeist right now. But after reading that book, I really feel like human creation of fixed nitrogen they say that they've increased the, uh, well, what's the percentage? It's now almost about to be 50%. Right, free, free nitrogen versus fixed nitrogen on the planet originally before the discovery of this this fertilizer process was like, what was it like, 20% 20, 20 is fixed nitrogen on the planet or 18% mm -hmm. or something? Yeah. And now we've actually increased that artificially to like 30% or something, or the, whatever the number is. Right. They have exponentially increased the, the actual amount of fixed nitrogen, which used to be only available, like you said, through these natural organisms or through bird guano other things like that. And this has led to this gigantic ability to, you know, process food. Uh, how big of a thing do you think, you know, artificial nitrogen is compared to, say, carbon, for instance? Um, I know right now it's something, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around because we ourselves don't fully understand the, the nitrogen cycle as it is unperturbed, and we're already making such drastic changes. So it's really hard to understand how it's changing when we never really had the firm understanding what the baseline was. Before we even was. started, that's right. Yeah. So what's that? Your your comments on that makes me think about the whole idea. As of right now, to the best of our understanding, we think the nitrogen cycle is a closed loop, meaning like all the nitrogen, the dinitrogen that's fixed and enters our food chain, will eventually there's a, a complementary process, denitrification, which returns that back into the atmosphere as dinitrogen gas. So with human beings perturbing the system and introducing even larger amounts of industrially fixed nitrogen into the thing, it, that could potentially drastically change the nitrogen cycle itself. So um, looking at paleoclimate records, we're thinking it's like about a 2,000 year cycle. So what we're doing right now could have really, really drastic implications down the line, like outside of our generations and generations of our kids and great, great grandkids even. So, can really tell you how how it will change at the at the at the moment. The best we can do is try to understand at least what we what's going on around us. Yes, sir. I don't know very much about it, but I've heard you know because of all the artificial fertilizers that it's, it's disturbed the, the farming situation in some way. Yeah. It, it, so I assume there's a negative side to having too much of. Is it is it the fact there's too much nitrogen? In the ecosystem, whether it's water or in the terrestrial ecosystem, yes. So you know, people will recommend you put X amount in, but with the fertilizer being as cheap as it is, and farmers wanting to say like, well, why? What we can try to potentially increase our crop yield even more. They'll put excess amounts into the soil. But what happens is when it rains or when, with irrigation, all that water eventually enters rivers and streams that empty out into the ocean. And the most pressing problem we see now, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, right, where the Mississippi River Delta empties out, which is the most prominent river that we have in North America, that runs right along the Midwest where you have most of our farming. What ends up happening is that you have these seasonal things where all that dumped off runoff uh, supports huge blooms, not just of macroalgae, but of microalgae as well. And it's really good for them, but eventually when, this is kind of bleak, but when all things live, they also die. So when you have those giant blooms and they die, what happens is in that immediate area in the surface ocean, when they die, all these microbes come in and they respire all that biomass and they deplete the oxygen around that area. And they, this is how we get these fish kills that we hear about every now and then in the news. So that's one of the, the more pressing problems that's happening with these runoffs.
What else? Fantastic. Thank All you right. so much. Yeah. Thank you.